what are you waiting for in terms of becoming the artist that you really dream of being? And I want to ask this question because I realize more and more as I send out emails dedicated to artistic development, develop, um, artistic identity and mindset, all of the things that we think that deeply impact what comes out of our brushes, how free we feel to communicate through our art, and how good we feel about our artistic practice. All of those things are so dependent on what's going on in here. Not just this part of the head, but all of it. <laughs> and I, I see artists struggling and feeling discouraged and sometimes quitting, not continuing because they have misconceptions about art, because they don't believe that they'll ever be good, that uh, they're looking for, they're using words like good enough. <laughs> Am I good enough to be an artist? Do I have what it takes to be an artist? Am I able to, do I have the gift? <laughs> and am I talented enough? Can I make the art I dream of making? Or am I always going to feel like I'm just stumbling around and kind of lost in this uh, desire to make art and not being able to make the art I really want to make? And this is, this is what artists struggle with and it doesn't go away. And yet it also can be so much richer than that. Uh, the one thing that I've learned, and I've had the opportunity to meet so many artists over the last 30 years of my own art practice, and the thing that's almost universal with a growth-oriented artist, I'm talking about artists who are so deeply connected to the art they're making. They're excited about what they're creating. They're making diverse, um, growing, evolving work. These are artists who don't have all the answers. And uh, there's a kind of beautiful uncertainty in what they, in how they present themselves as artists. There's like a humility and a I don't know what's next, but I'm so excited to discover it kind of kind of mentality. They're curious. They're non-judgmental. Uh, they are some of the loveliest people that you're going to meet. And uh, I've also <laughs> had uh, the opportunity, the misfortune perhaps, to meet artists who communicate a very different message, who make it sa seem as though they have a certainty you're never going to get, and you don't get to be included in, you know, the, the joys of making art unless you are doing, following the rules, and you have the gift, um, you know, you get, you qualify in some way. And uh, so there's, there's very different um, value systems that are at work here. And with that, uh, I think <laughs> there's a, an abuse of power that goes on when artists start to communicate a kind of exclusivity or um, transmit per messages with that kind of certainty that you can, there is a right and a wrong way to do things. You want to be on the right side and you want to be, you know, you want to qualify to fit in that rarefied air that these artists with all the certainty are breathing. And uh, I know which side is more rewarding, which side I want to be on. I don't want to be an artist who ever communicates that kind of toxic mentality that makes you feel like you are not good enough because you're over in your little corner messing around like a hobby artist and somehow that disqualifies you from being able to take your art seriously, to talk to other artists, to share your work with any kind of openness, um, honesty and joy. And so this is why I do what I do. This is why I teach artist mindset and this is why I teached myself every single day, because as a young artist, I thought that I needed to make a perfect painting in order to feel good about my art. And I thought that when I made a perfect painting, I would feel good about my art. And that became my goal. And the problem with using words like perfect, <laughs> um, the problem with using phrases like good enough is that there's no actual there's no actual landing place where you've arrived and everything's fine from there on out. No artist is going to make a perfect painting because we start from a flawed premise. We start with a picture in our mind of what our painting should look like, but it's a half formed picture. It's like trying to communicate your dream. You're going to realize that there's big gaps in the timeline that you just hadn't thought of yet. And so we come to this idea of a painting 
with an incomplete information. You cannot make a perfect painting if your information is incomplete. Um, we, if you're wanting to be a realistic painter, you're still going to come with, in, with imperfect information because your camera is limited. So if you're taking a reference photo, no matter how many you take, your camera does not have the sensitivity that the human eye does. So you're not able to make a perfect painting simply because you don't have uh, even a reference photo that can adequately depict the scene that you saw when you were standing there from life. And if you're painting from life and wanting to make a perfect painting, you're immediately out of luck because you can't paint that fast. The lighting changes, the scene changes, and you've lost wherever you started has vanished into history. And so we come to this idea of perfection um, and never really analyze the, the truth that we cannot achieve it if we are basing it on some kind of starting point. And for me, um, one, one cure for that has been recognizing that my original idea is a jumping off point. It's a prompt and where I end up is determined by the quality of what I invest into my painting process. And so I create a beautiful process for my painting practice and the outcome, although I can't see what my painting will be, I get to uh, make a beautiful process that births a beautiful painting. And uh, that's been very, very freeing for me. I think we also, uh, the term good enough um, is also flawed because once again, good enough is not a good determiner. It's, it doesn't define our goal and our outcome. Maybe good enough means you get approval by that artist you're trying to impress. So you've got some mentor or instructor and uh, if you can paint a painting that they're happy with, you will know you've arrived. Uh, the problem with that is, is once you meet their approval that one time, Either you need to also now meet it every time, or there's gonna be someone else whose approval you need to meet or exceed. Uh, for me, uh, I looked for milestones to feel good about my art practice. I made a painting that was good enough that I could join the art gallery, uh, the local arts group in my community, and exhibit with them. Uh, then the next goal, of course, was to win an award at one of their events. And then once I had won that one award, well, it was just a people's choice award. So now I needed an award where the juror actually determined that it was the best painting in the show. And of course, that's completely dependent on the taste of that juror. juror and uh, <laughs> that, that's something I can't control at all. Whether or not they'll like my painting's style, substance, color theory, uh, or if they're using a different criteria than I do to evaluate the painting. Uh, once I'd won a local award, then, oh, it became about winning a national award, being good enough to be considered a good Canadian artist. And of course, beyond that, the world, <laughs> there's no, there's no actual place where you get to land and say, boy, you know, look at everything I've achieved. I can feel good about my art because of my accomplishments. There's always that next thing and you never really get to settle in and just value what you have. And so good enough not a great marker for feeling good about your art practice either. So what can an artist do if you cannot make a perfect painting? And if good enough is a marker that's always moving, how can we know if we should be feeling good about our art practice or not? How do we take our negative feelings around our art practice, the paintings that we're so disappointed in, and look at uh, a way of changing our thinking um, or convincing ourselves or having someone else convince us that what we are creating is good and valued and valid. I think about, of course, as a young artist, my mom loved my paintings and she still does. But of course, that wasn't good enough. She was just my mom. And so once again, that idea of needing someone else to approve my work was a sliding scale um, of how seriously I was going to take their opinion. And what I've recognized over many years of painting, and it's taken such a long time, I do not recommend being uh, so hard to convince as I have been, um, but I've realized that this space, my art practice, whether it's at my kitchen table or on the living room sofa or here in my beautiful studio, my art practice is deeply personal. And I should be making it my goal to create a practice that gives me what I need 
first of all, last of all, anything else beyond that is a perk, a wonderful perk and a gift, <laughs> but a perk and a gift nonetheless. And there have been times now, as I've changed the way I think about my art practice, that I can be in this process of painting in watercolor. And watercolor is a beautiful medium. I highly recommend it. Um, but whatever medium you're choosing to create, um, if you are fully invested in the process of painting, time falls away. Your focus becomes narrowed in on what's in front of you. Um, and you're witnessing something so beautiful that whether or not the outcome turns out, it's, it's like witnessing a beautiful sunset. We don't get to keep a sunset. Even our photographs limit, um, you know, that ability to convey what we saw in reality. But to be a witness to something beautiful as it evolves becomes a beautiful gift that's very deeply personal and intimate. And I've started to recognize that even if I ruin a painting, if there were moments of beauty and I made the choice to be a witness to those moments of beauty, there is something profound that is happening in my art practice. And that meaning that gets brought into the artistic practice, it's incredibly powerful. It changes the way I look at myself. No longer do I just become a machine, a production generator of the next good painting. I become a valued individual in this quiet little space of my studio, noticing something beautiful and being valuable because I receive the privilege of noticing something beautiful. I value my own life in a different way. Um, and, you know, not just by what I contribute, but by what I get, my, the place I get to be in, uh, in my life. And uh, I, I always feel like I don't explain that well. There, there's just a limit to how I can communicate that. But boy, I would love for everyone to witness that themselves and to experience that in their creative practice. And it's why over the years, uh, I started out teaching on YouTube here, uh, teaching watercolor techniques and talking about engaging with the process, getting excited about what I was painting, trying to communicate that idea of creating a beautiful process and beautiful paintings that come out of that process. But over the years, I've recognized that there's also that um, struggle when I teach watercolor technique of people wanting to be happy with an art practice that looks just like mine. And that's, that's not really a thing. Your art practice needs to look like you. And you need to be free to be the artist you're meant to be. And that's why in 2024, I'm stepping away from teaching watercolor techniques and moving directly into this idea of creating a beautiful process, owning your artistic identity, Def defining and realizing who you're meant to be as an artist so that you can create a beautiful practice that looks like you, that feels like you, that you deeply resonate with, that brings you great joy. <laughs> I mean, what? I, I, that just sounds like win, win, win to me. And if that is the process you're pursuing, uh, you recognize that it's also worth the risk. It's worth the failed paintings. It's worth being in a place where you don't know all the answers, but you get to engage in discovering what some of the good questions are to ask in your paintings. And uh, that thrill of recognition when you see your heart emerging on the page. I'm so excited about what 2024 holds for my artistic practice and for what I get to teach to artists. Uh, mentoring you through this um, ownership of your artistic practice. Self-development in skill. Yes, we want to grow in our skill and technique, but we want to grow in skill and technique so that we can better express the voice of the inner artist. And uh, that's where things start to get really exciting and really real. And uh, boy, it's going to be a fun journey. If this is something that you're excited about, if you've noticed that when you take watercolor classes or art classes, um, it's very, very tempting, alluring for you to want to just copy the artist and yet you're yearning for your own individual style. This is where we're going to be exploring that, stepping away from relying on any one person for your style decisions, for um, even growth and technique. All of these can be created in within a framework that you create and define as an artist. And you get to take your power back that way. You get to own your decisions and uh, find some freedom from that desperate need to meet someone else's approval. I'm excited about what this means for you 
because I've seen it transform my own artistic practice. And I hope you'll join me in 2024. We're going to be kicking off the year in January with the Heart Led Artist Pathway. It's a four week course. It's a taster uh, designed to help you uh, see some of the values and processes that I bring to this idea of artistic identity and skill development. And uh, then in February, we'll be moving into a six month program that uh, lets us kind of sit with these concepts uh, and unpack them even further. So I hope you'll join me. Uh, take a look at my website, heartledartist.com. Uh, there's a reason we're calling it heartledartist.com. I think you can figure it out and I hope you'll join me. Thanks for watching.